Good afternoon. Welcome to another afternoon tea with me, Gareth. I'm glad you could join us. Uh, we're working through John 13 to 17. We're in the second half of John chapter 14 this afternoon. So why don't you grab your Bibles and let's get stuck right into it. Jesus is teaching his disciples and he says to them, this is how people are going to know that you love me. How can you, my followers, show that you love me? Verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands. Have a look again at verse 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Have a look again at verse 23. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. That's how a follower of Jesus is distinguished, or at least that's how people know that you love Jesus, by keeping his commands, obeying his teaching. This is going to be a key benchmark again for the disciples as the world looks at them. And it's important to note that it's not just mere duty. Uh, mere duty alone will not generate obedience, uh, one writer says. Only love can do that. Obedience comes from love. And that's what Jesus wants from his disciples. It's worth loving Jesus, mind you. Have a look at the benefits of loving Jesus. Verse 21. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and show myself to them. God the Father and Jesus himself will love you if you keep the commands. And they will come and be with you. They will show themselves to you, verse 21. But look at verse 23. My Father will love them, will come to them, and make our home with them. Jesus will be in us as we are in Him, if indeed we love Him by keeping His commands. Now that's the one big thing that this passage uh, speaks about, but there's another thing. Jesus recognizes that it's not always easy to keep His commands, and you and I will know that too. So He says to them, well, I'm going to offer you some additional assistance. And he says that in verse 16, I'm going to ask the Father and he's going to give you, the NIV translation says, another advocate. Some translations read another helper, which is slightly more generic. The advocate term is a bit judicial, I guess, legal. And so some translations prefer to say helper. The other translations might use, like a King James version, might say parakeet. That's the original word, and it's probably the word that best describes this term. It's an all-encompassing term, but it really describes someone who, who assists another, who supports another. So some might even say that it's a comforter or an encourager. Who is this other advocate? Well, he's identified here as the Spirit of Truth. Later in this very same passage, he's identified as the Holy Spirit himself. It's the Spirit of Christ who's coming to live with his disciples in them. Jesus recognizes that it's tough to do things on our own, and so we have this extraordinary helper, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. What is his role? <clears throat> well, you'll see in verse 17, 16, 17, that he will be with them and he will help them. That's, the, that's what he does. He helps them. He's with them. He's present amongst them. There are five paraclete sayings in the Upper Room Discourse, and two come out of John 14 here. The second one we can see in verse 25, 26, 27. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything. Notice that it is the Father who sends the Spirit through the Son or in the name of the Son. And there again, the Spirit does two things. The Spirit will teach them everything and will remind them of everything that Jesus has said. Jesus and the Spirit are working in tandem. It's important here to recognize that as we are taught by God's Word, it's actually the work of the Spirit at work in us uh, through the Word, teaching us the things of God. It's the Spirit that reminds us of the things that Jesus has said. When you're struggling with a particular sin, your conscience pricks you. It's probably the work of the Spirit in you at that time to remind you of the things that Jesus has said. When you're chatting to someone or counseling someone, uh, caring for somebody, maybe even sometimes rebuking someone and a verse pops into your mind, well, that's the Spirit reminding you of everything that Jesus has said. Oh, how we should thank God for the Holy Spirit who is present with us to this day. 
It's a great message of comfort again, if you think of that theme of comfort that Jesus is um, teaching his disciples here. And of course, he says again to them, have a look at verse 27. Don't let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. Jesus is giving them the Holy Spirit. And that's why it's so important that he goes to the Father. See, God's great plan meant that Jesus needed to go to the Father because if he went to the Father, then the Spirit could come to be with the disciples. That's why Jesus says to them, if you love me, you'll know that I need to go to the Father. You'll be glad that I'm going because the Father's plans are great. The Father is greater than I. He's mapped this all out. And so Jesus wants his disciples again to trust him. He's going to give them peace, peace they will have when the Spirit is with them also. Now, Jesus says here that he doesn't give as the world gives. And the world is a term that John uses to describe the sinful, rebellious world, the world that is in opposition to Jesus. And so when we read world, we should understand that. He's talking about the sinful opposition to Jesus and God. And Jesus says here he gives, not as the world gives. Throughout this passage and John's gospel, you can read it again and learn about how John portrays the world. But here we see that the world won't even know the Spirit. The world won't see the Spirit. The world won't recognize him. The world won't see Jesus any longer, but his disciples will because Jesus will be in them. And so they'll see Jesus being manifested through the lives of each other. Jesus says that the world doesn't give as I give. The world can't give peace. The world can't give the Spirit. The world can't give as generously as Jesus, as lovingly as Jesus, as sacrificially as Jesus, as abundantly as Jesus. I hope that you've received this gift of the Holy Spirit from Jesus. I hope you recognize that the world can't give as Jesus gives. The final thing Jesus says here to his disciples is, look, I've got to stop talking. The prince of this world is coming. In other words, Satan or the devil is coming. And in fact, it's important that he comes too. Because when he comes, the world is going to learn that Jesus loves the Father and dies just as the Father commanded him. When Jesus dies on that cross, it's a sign for the world and for the prince of this world, really, that their plans have failed. It's a sign that Jesus loves the Father and that Jesus has been obedient to the Father, even to the point of death. Jesus is once again in this passage comforting his disciples telling them what they should be expecting for life after Jesus. As we end the session together, maybe after this, it might be worthwhile praying to God and thanking him for the spirit, thanking him for the manner in which Jesus gives. It's important maybe to ask God to help us to remain obedient to Jesus's commands and to Jesus's teaching. It's not always easy, but that's why we're there to help each other do it together. And that's why we have God's spirit in us help us do this. Well, I hope you've had a good afternoon with us. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow as we get stuck into John chapter 15. Have a good evening.